process here, which will be that there will be four topics. Um, there'll be one main speaker on each topic, but the other speakers will chip in and say what they want to say about it as well. Uh, we'll then move to uh, audience questions, which uh, for reasons of efficiency, I will be taking from the question screen and asking rather than switching the microphone around. Um, that means that uh, we're very much encouraging the audience to use the uh, Q&A facility to post the questions that they want to have asked. It, asked. And ideally, there'll be lots of questions and lots of participation. The uh, four speakers on the topics we, we've got today are as follows. Uh, William Perrin uh, will be the lead speaker on principles versus rule-based rule regulation, uh, the role of a statutory duty of care. Uh, William is a trustee of the Carnegie UK Trust um, and much else besides, indeed. Um, the next session will then be Catherine Ross uh, on what compliance problems are set by Ofcom's fairness framework and how might it best evolve. And uh, Catherine is Director of Regulatory Affairs at the BT Group PLC. Third session uh, will be led by uh, Tania Vandenbrander, who will be talking about the implications of principles based on rule based regulation for competition. And uh, Tania is the Director of Economics at uh, Ofcom. And then the fourth and final session uh, will be led by Oliver Bethel. Uh, and this one is about principles, prohibitions, and fairness by design, the regulatory's perspective. And he is, uh, Oliver is Director EMEA Competition at uh, Google. So we have a very good uh, roster of speakers and, and I think very interesting topics. Um, just a brief comment about myself, and it will be brief. Uh, I am chairing this event partly because of um, I'm also the chair of Oxiera's Regulation and Market Design Center of Excellence, but also because um, I had a long career in financial regulation where the question of principles-based regulation and how best to use it came up many times. And I'm just going to give an extremely brief, um, I hope succinct summary of what happened uh, in financial regulation, because I think it will provide a useful set of background ideas for when you're hearing the speakers in a moment. So in FS, uh, the idea of principles based regulation actually started in the 80s with the Securities and Investments Board, and it used its rulemaking power to set, uh, to set out a, a group of principles which it felt that firms ought to follow. They were sometimes jokingly referred to as the Ten Commandments. The rationale was partly to provide a guide where there were gaps in detailed rules, but also to help with enforcement because it would give an idea of the kind of thing firms were meant to be achieving. Whether or not this was a success was actually debated quite a lot, but when the Financial Services Authority was um, established by the uh, new Labour government in the late 90s, um, it did carry on with the uh, SIB principles. Um, and indeed, the uh, first uh, CEO of the FSA, John Tyner, um, felt very strongly that the rule book was ridiculously complex at that stage. Um, and needed to be cut, and the principles would be the way to do it. And he did uh, take a number of actually valuable steps towards reduction. The problem, on the other hand, was that every time there was a, a regulatory problem, um, there was a demand for more detail in, in, in the rules, and indeed there was also a demand for a greater scope of regulation. So although John cut things from the rule book, the rule book also grew for other reasons, and uh, uh, he was, I think, not totally happy with the way it all turned out. But anyway, that's what he did. Um, when Hector Sands became the uh, CEO of the FCA, uh, of the FSA, sorry, um, he also continued with principles-based regulation, but he in fact uh, eventually abandoned it, uh, coming up with the marvelous aphorism that there's no point in having principles-based regulation when the people you're regulating lack principles. It's a very stinging comment uh, by him and it was very heartfelt as well at the time. And then, so then principles based regulation disappeared uh, until we had a revival of it in yet another form from the Financial Conduct Authority, the FCA. And here, um, a strong connection was made between principles uh, and the outcomes that were achieved in the market. Um, and this, in a sense, this treating customers fairly maybe was a more powerful formulation given the link to outcomes, although outcomes are hard to measure. Um, but at the same time, it led to another uh, set of criticism of the financial regulators that they were wandering into social policy, and that is something they should not be doing. And indeed, that is 
part of the Treasury's current review of the future of financial regulation. Anyway, so there's my potted history of principles-based regulation in FS, which is just background. Uh, and I'm now going to hand over to uh, William for his session. Thank you, Peter, and, and thank you to Oxera and Ofcom and uh, IIC. I think it, I'm particularly delighted to be talking to a typically international IIC audience, because at this time of great regulatory change, communities like the IIC are incredibly important to mutual understanding and policy development around the world. Um, not so much so that we can learn from each other, but also we can learn, most importantly, from each other's mistakes. And it couldn't be more appropriate, I think, that we're meeting now because the UK has set um, the, air, the challenge of online safety regulation as a work strand in its uh, G7 presidency. And we'll, I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about that as the year rolls through. Now, in this talk, I'm going to do a little bit like Peter, but I'm going to go further back. I'm going to set some historical context for principles-based regimes in the UK that have replaced rules-based regimes that didn't really work. Now, the current UK government proposals for regulating online safety arguably have their roots in work Professor Lorna Woods and I did at Carnegie UK Trust in 2018. Back in 2018, uh, we'd noticed that there was uh, a lot of indicative evidence of harms arising from the operation of internet platforms, and there was a lot of heat and light, but politicians and commentators were very short on solutions, and there was a, a notable absence in discourse of models for regulating what were then known as online harms. So as a piece of curiosity-led work, we sat down and uh, we started to think through some of the issues based on our own experience of regulation. A long time ago, I did the work that created um, Ofcom when I was a civil servant. I worked on energy regulation, regulation of pubs, bars and clubs and uh, a few other things. And Lorna had a huge track record in what used to be called TMT regulation as, as a city lawyer and then an expert on European issues as, as an academic. So we started to develop a conceptual model of what it was, um, what the entities were that we needed, uh, needed, arguably needed some regulation to reduce harms. And we formed the view that the brilliant uh, technology platform companies, the platform services companies that, um, of which I'm a heavy user, and I'm a very strong fan and advocate for the good things that they do. We formed a view that those companies had created in their products synthetic worlds within which their rules and their code controlled everything. Um, as Lessig would say, code is law within those environments. Every single pixel you see on a screen when you use a social media service is there as a result of decisions taken by the company that creates and runs that platforms decisions about the service design the terms and conditions uh, the the software and the resources put into maintaining uh, those things and the activity going on within those worlds as anyone who uses them knows was is astonishingly diverse it encompasses by sort of behavior type almost all the uk regulated sectors many of whom are on this call and the rest of life as well the diversity is astonishing so prima facie, in our opinion, a rules-based approach would be super complex and just wouldn't work. And in particular, a rules-based approach would not cope, a static rules-based approach would not cope with the constantly changing environments that in fact made those environments so exciting and so desirable for so many people around the world. And we could already see, of course, that the rules-based approach, um, which you could say arguably it's a rule, um, that the courts um, implement weren't really delivering an effective dispute resolution process where the criminal law might have been broken. And this, of course, was one of the many factors that pointed towards uh, and the appropriateness of a civil regulatory regime to deal with uh, this and other issues. We also wanted to prompt companies to think harder about safety in the design and operation of their services. Now, I have an optimistic view, uh, having regulated lots and lots of sectors, despite that cruel comment that people you regulate uh, don't have any principles. Um, I have quite an optimistic view that um, excellent companies, and are, these are excellent companies in this space, generally want to behave responsibly and they want to safeguard their, their, um, their, the safety of their users and other people. But in the tech sector, there were some signs, dare I say it, that that culture maybe wasn't fully in place. And I was very struck by a quote we use quite a lot from Sean Parker, who was one of the co-founders of Facebook, in an interview with Axios in 2017. 
And I think this represented the mindset of some of the early stages of product development in, in these industries. Sean said, uh, God only knows what it's doing to our children's brains. The thought process that went into building these applications, Facebook being the first of them, was all about how do we consume as much of your time and conscious attention as possible? And that means we need to sort of give you a little dopamine hit every once in a while because someone liked or commented on a post or photo or whatever. And that's going to get you to contribute more content. That's going to get you more likes and comments. It's a social validation feedback loop, exactly the kind of thing like that a hacker like myself will come up with because we're exploiting a vulnerability in human psychology. So against that background, we felt that there was some scope for um, a traditional principles-based approach that seeks to influence uh, behavior and decision-making in, in senior management. So we sought though, reflecting the scale and the magnitude of, um, of, uh, of uh, activity on these platforms, we also look for a structural solution that targeted the company's systems, uh, the systems that the company runs that deliver um, the, the, uh, an outcome to people who use them. This was something we'd first experimented with in 2016 when we'd supported a private member's bill by an attorney MP, the Malicious Communications Social Media Bill. Um, but the regime had to focus, a systems-based regime must focus on improving the outcomes of people's lived experience. And of course, by focusing on the outcomes, you can, if you do it right, remove some of the complexity in regulation because you are looking at the outcome no matter how it is attained within reason. So we went back to an approach that had been used historically in Britain, and forgive me for all the Brits here, if I just rehearse this, because we have an international audience, um, a, a, an approach that had been used historically in Britain when rules-based approaches had failed, uh, the so-called statutory duty of care. Now, these statutory duties of care first came about in the 1950s, when the government and the Law Reform Committee, I think it was the predecessor of the Law Commission, uh, recognised that giving people the right to sue landowners for harm that befell them wasn't working. The operation of the common law had created an intricate rules-based regime that wasn't delivering an equitable outcome. Um, and uh, the Occupiers Liability Act 1957 created the first statutory duty of care. And Viscount Kilmore, Kilmuir was uh, the Lord Chancellor who took it through the House. And Kilmuir was a, a Nuremberg prosecutor, one of the great, uh, Maxwell Fife, one of the great uh, lawyers of the second part of the 20th century. He said, in the course of its development by numerous discussions of the courts, decisions of the courts, the common law has hardened into rigid categories which no longer represent the needs of the present day and have led to needless refinements and distinctions of little merit. Now, uh, a, a major iteration in statutory duties came uh, from the late 1960s when Barbara Castle, then a minister, created the Robbins Review of Industrial Safety. And this followed a series of industrial disasters where the law and regulation had not protected people in the workplace. And in fact, millions of people were outside the scope of any workplace safety law. And since the late 18th century, and in particular since the first Factory Act of 1819, Parliament had made thousands of laws on safety in workplaces. And I spoke to a civil servant that worked on the uh, 1974 Act, um, he's retired, long since retired, and he said they couldn't actually find some of the laws when they came to abolish them. They had literally no extant copies of some things from the 18th century um, that were still allegedly in force. And in fact, they, they eventually found them um, at ICI, uh, which they had to use as their, as their repository of where the laws had gone. It was so complex, uh, it had stopped working because as the work bases had changed over the years, new hazards were revealed, more and more safety laws were brought in. So by the late 1960s, it really wasn't working. The rules-based regime had reached its limits. And Robbins recommended in his review, removing all of these detailed rules and replacing them with an overarching statutory duty of care. And the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974 created a duty on employers to take reasonable steps to prevent people coming to reasonably foreseeable harm, overseen by a new unified regulator, replacing dozens of monitoring bodies. Now, it's not quite that simple, obviously, but it's almost that simple. Now, um, Professor Woods and I saw strong similarities between the huge, diverse synthetic environments of workplaces and the rapidly evolving synthetic worlds of online platform services. So we proposed a statutory duty of care that would require companies to take reasonable steps to prevent reasonably foreseeable harms arising to people as a result of the operation of their platforms. Companies should assess the risks posed by their systems and mitigate them appropriately. And the companies should be accountable to a regulator for their performance at a high level. Now, what we were sketching out was very much an 80-20 regime. A principles-based approach can't catch all the instances of harm, but nor can a rules-based one. 
So you have to choose really from which end you are starting in designing a regulatory system. Our approach was very much outcome focused and we emphasized that the company should focus on their systems. Are the systems the companies run safe for people to use and for others? And most importantly, the statutory duty approach is forward looking. It's, it's, it requires companies to look forward at harms. And so it is relatively future proof and allows huge room for innovation within a field that is defined by the extent of its remarkable innovation. Now it does, as any principle-based regime, we'll come to this several times, I think, in, in other talks, require companies to make judgments. And that's okay. These are brilliant, ingenious companies. We keep being told how brilliant they are. And we think they're quite capable of making judgments about safety rather than having to fall back on a rule set uh, that tells them what to do. And indeed, it may be more appropriate that the companies that run these vastly complex uh, systems with code in it that is mysterious, slightly magical, they sometimes like to say, um, that they should make the judgments about how best to achieve the outcomes of reduction of harm. But it doesn't mean that there are no rules. I think it's a false dichotomy to say that you have a principles-based regime and a rules-based regime. Um, there will always be harms in any rules, in any principles. <laughs> I'm not the first person to get them the wrong way around. I am the first person to get them the wrong way around. Um, there will always be harms that arise in any principles-based system um, that are so foreseeable or so heinous that Parliament, which of course essentially creates the framework, will want specific rules to be made about them to safeguard the public interest. But they sit within the overarching principle of a statutory duty of care in this case. Now, of course, in the online harms world, it was it's, with some irony, uh, we noted that the government has actually set out detailed rules in codes of practice on the very difficult topics of protecting children from abuse and preventing terrorist uh, material being distributed. Bef the government set rules out on them before it's even published what its duty of care is going to do. So it's a very clear si signal that we're going to have an overarching principle in this regime and a rules-based regime. But that essentially leads to the key question for us to discuss through the rest of this, of this session, which is in all the sectors we work in, where on the spectrum from pure principles to detailed rules, do we need to be to deliver the best outcomes for citizens. I stopped rather suddenly there, Peter. Over to you. <laughs> so at this point, um, the, other, the other speakers have a chance to make any observations they want to uh, on this topic, and then we move to questions. I wouldn't mind coming in, Peter, if uh, that's OK. Sure. Um, I want to start with um, how you might get companies in practice to take the principles that will come from the online harms regime and really get them to engage with those principles. And I think uh, what ultimately the regime is going to look like is still a little bit up in the air as government is, is writing legislation and, and ultimately it's up to parliament. But what we already know from some of the things that government has, has talked about is that there's potentially a tool that we'll be able to use to encourage companies to really embed these principles in how they do business. And that tool is one of a risk assessment. And essentially the idea here is that companies don't wait for harm to arise and then tackle it, but rather to take sort of frequent stock of what the harms might be that could arise on their platform. Um, identify those as risks and then proactively try and put processes in place to mitigate that risk. So if you like, rather than have a ex post approach to tackling online content harms, it's really moving to an ex ante approach where you try and spot the harm and tackle it before it arises. And a second observation I wanted to make is sort of um, as an economist, the way that we think about regulation, it's all about what the incentives are for platforms or services in these cases to sort of adhere to the rules. And on the one hand, um, you know, there might be fining powers and uh, reputational damage if there's enforcement cases. But I hope that there will be also other ways in which we can create much more positive incentives for platforms to put good protections in place. And here I'm thinking of some of the media literacy and transparency proposals that government has put out there as potential regulatory tools that we'll be able to use. Um, and particularly to the extent that we can use those tools to 
cultivate and strengthen user awareness of the risks that they might face, do we almost end up allowing companies that offer good protection to gain a competitive advantage of that in a way that then generates positive incentives to keep and maintain those protections in place? Um, now, ultimately, uh, where we end up on the scale, uh, we'll have to see as the online harms or the online safety bill gets passed. Um, but I think from my perspective, to try and embed those principles, really uh, a good way to think about it would be to, to combine lots of the levers that we'll have to ultimately give the right incentives for platforms to deliver on the goal of the online safety bill. Yeah, I think that's that's very sound. And the 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 great thing about risk assessment is that it's it's not exactly novel. Um, there is vast experience of risk assessing uh, systems from the ultra dangerous ones, the nuclear reactors and petrochemical crackers, um, all the way down to sandwich bars. And uh, there is a huge. It's not just in the UK, but there's a global um, body of work on on risk assessment and how to do it. So, um, and given that these are, as I've said several times, quite brilliant companies, I think they can pick that up and run with it. And I do hope um, that uh, there is an opportunity for companies as the regime gets through to if if they are clearly doing an excellent job of managing uh, of, of mitigating risks and reducing harms that they are they they are almost not we're not quite left alone but they just put on a watching brief um, and there's no need to engage them too much uh, in in that process but the other economic point of course um because uh, i forgot you're you're a brilliant economist and i'm just a bad economist um is the is is external costs um, so you know, an important part of this regime is returning the external costs of those harms that fall outside the company um, back to the production decision to influence how services are designed. And we have lurking in the background, um, this um, uh, many things lurking in the background in this area, as well as all the, the competition policy work going on, um, is the question of taxation and to what extent taxation is used at all. Taxation as a policy tool has fallen out of fashion in, in much of the uh, global north, uh, well, it's certainly in, in the UK, um, but we still have unresolved these OECD discussions around taxation of um, international revenues and how they're repatriated. So there's something interesting there, um, which I hope gets considered in the round, but um, there's very rarely a perfect policy process from my long experience of policy processes. They're always a little bit messy. And sometimes you have to have a couple of scoes at them to get them to work right. Peter, if I, if I may, I, I can react on, uh, from uh, my perspective as a, as a Google person. Um, I, I think these are, these are very interesting ideas. I think just to, to react a little to um, the notion of opportunity in compliance, competing in compliance, I guess, is the way I'm putting it. I think that's something that's very real uh, at tech companies, certainly at Google, the sense that, I mean, the cynic would say, you know, if you can get ahead, um, you can uh, it, avoid less time with people like Ollie, right, is one of the great benefits. Yeah, so there's less time ex executive meetings, less time given to uh, regulatory concerns. If you've managed to create a fit for purpose compliance program that's working effectively, you can delegate a lot of that decision making. So there's some time saving benefits there. I think the reputational benefits are very front of mind often for, for companies. I think they're sort of slotted into, uh, you know, alongside revenue impact, reputational harm. When you are a search engine, for example, and there is a, a lot of reliance on trust in your services, the, the relevance of the ranking, how you're going to be providing consumer facing services to your users, having the validation of having engaged with an agency on the way that those underlying technologies works can be tremendously valuable. I think there's a commercial benefit there also to you to be able to say that. So just two observations, I agree very much with, with, with both Will and, and Tanya on, on the, the potential opportunities for companies. Now, one slightly, let me just one second of, of two comments. I do think that when it comes to risk assessments, which certainly that's absolutely what we're doing within the company, that in all, it is important from my perspective at least to establish a relationship of trust between the company and the agency. And <clears throat> I think some of that requires a careful diagnosis of the problem initially and a filtering of some concerns. It's no surprise to any of you that Google, we see a lot of complaints about various aspects of our business I think if an in-house lawyer like me is uh, going to be armed with the material to get executive attention, I need to be able to go with them with evidence of uh, a reasonable concern externally. And I think there is a, there's a responsibility with the agency to come and say, listen, we have this evidence, we've looked at the complaints, we've, we've sent questions to them before we came to you. 
that sets us up for an internal discussion where we can say, look, this is a reasonable, we act with, within the in-house team as an extension of the agency often to say, this is a reasonable concern. We need to think seriously about this and this is, should inform our risk assessment. So I think there's that pre-filtering and analysis diagnostics that can often be very helpful to the, the risk assessment that we then, then do ourselves. Thank you. Well, I think that that has to be right. And Lorna Woods and I uh, uh, deliberated for quite some time amongst ourselves as to whether there was a case for setting up a new regulator or suggesting that the issue goes to Ofcom. And the government deliberated for even longer. You know, they, they took over a year and a half, I think, to work out where to put the regulatory responsibility. And we, and eventually the government, okay, came around to the view that Ofcom was the kind of regulator with whom you could do that. And there was a big risk in creating a new regulator, which was, there were a number of proposals around to create big, fancy, new, all singing, all dancing regulators, um, would not have the confidence or the maturity necessarily to be able to uh, have that dialogue. Um, and I, I do hope that um, Ofcom will feel confident and able to do that as they do with, with to some extent with broadcasters and others. Um, because it, when you're regulating a novel subject, you need to have that discussion with innovators and practitioners to really get the hang of what is going on. Catherine, do you, do you want to say anything on this topic? No, not specifically uh, on, on the online harms question, but I, I, I do think that the discussion raises some, some, some really interesting questions generally about um, how you establish a new regulatory regime, almost de novo, um, with companies who are not used to operating within this kind of regulation. Um, and I think, you know, my, my personal view on this is I, I, I'm, I'm very happy to see this, this go down a sort of a principles based road, because I think when, when you're trying to set something up in a sector where the technology is fast paced, uh, you know, we can do stuff this year that we couldn't even imagine doing last year, um, where the regulator is getting its head around what it means to regulate in this space. Society is getting its head around what good looks like in this space, creating a system that is able at a reasonable degree of pace um, to circle around that, try it, learn, review, discuss, revise, move on, you know, repeat that learning cycle. I think that's really, really important. And I completely agree uh, with Will that I think Ofcom is exactly uh, the right organization to, to put this in, because as you say, and I'll, I'll say something a little bit about when I talk about this in respect of consumer fairness, you do need a level of maturity in an organization to embark on quite an open learning, discursive, evolutionary process. And I think, I hope that's, that's what we're about to embark on with online harms. I think the discussion is very promising. Thank you. Um, we, we do have some interesting questions in the Q&A. So I wonder whether I could ask a couple of those now uh, to whoever in the panel wants to answer really, but maybe it's first William. So the shortest question, a very interesting one, is uh, who decides what is a harm? Anybody want to uh, take that one? Yeah, well, it's, it's great. It's always great fun, this one. Um, the courts have been deciding what harm is for quite a long time in, in a variety of different measures. And so have Ofcom in the context of, of some issues of broadcasting. Um, but I always say that the best way of deciding what is harmful is to ask the victims of harm. So if someone presents and says, I have been, you know, I've been a victim of harm that's been brought about by the operation of these platforms. Uh, a good, broadly based qualitative research will start to divine what those answers are. But there also needs to be judgment within companies about harmful outcomes on, on their customers. And they're already doing that. We can see that as they enforce their, their community standards. So um, there needs to be a combination of maturity and, and open research between in a dialogue between the regulator and the regulated companies, but most importantly, a victim-led approach. Thank you, Will. Uh, that, that question was from Martin Barnes. Um, there's a question from uh, Alex Krasadomsky, which says, this is directed to Will, which says, the mood music internationally seems to be favorable to the UK's direction of travel. Do you think onlookers are excited about the principles themselves, that is the whole package, or rather the approach and that they all set their own principles. Uh, Alex, hello, um, and, and I'm rather nervous answering this question because I know Alex talks to even more people internationally than I do. Um, the, uh, so we're seeing in Europe and the DSA, uh, um, 
we see an approach that has some similarities, um, a risk management, a risk assessment of systems and a, a due diligence um, in, in, in applying mitigation. Um, or at least however it eventually turns out. And that has some similarities to the UK approach. So that is good. It's not exactly the same, but it's quite similar because it's talking about systems and risk management. Then in Australia, we see a different approach um, that is more uh, rules-based around, around speech. Um, we have proposals will emerge very shortly in Canada. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure how they're going to go, but they're, they're reviewing their entire regulatory regime. Uh, we have proposals in India I've not studied yet, uh, which are quite new. Uh, Japan is bringing in new proposals next year, uh, though they are quite limited to um, cyberbullying, reflecting a particularly tragic incident in Japan. And we all wait with bated breath to see what the Biden administration does, of course. Um, now, uh, Biden, in his, uh, Biden said he would bring in a task force on online violence towards women and girls. Uh, there was a commitment to do that. Um, and that might be a way of addressing some of the issues in, in, a, in a context where you have the First Amendment dominating discussion of rules on speech and an abandonment of the fairness doctrine in broadcasting in the late 80s and so on. So um, I think people have been motivated around the world that I've spoken to that the UK has provided a, a framework with a credible solution in it to a problem that previously was regarded as insoluble. And, and that's, that's a good feeling, but each country will do its own thing. And that's why I mentioned the G7 at the outset, because that gives an opportunity to bring people together. But I feel we need broader coordination um, between, particularly between democracies uh, on this policy area, because everybody is working on this and it's the same four or five companies or maybe as many as 10 companies that will bear the brunt of it. And it would make everybody's lives easier if there was some coordination, but there's no treaty base for that. And there's no obvious a grouping, international grouping within which to do it. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Will. Um, there is one more question, but I, I fear we are actually in danger of overrunning. So I wonder whether we should actually move to Catherine's uh, presentation next, uh, which is on uh, the uh, Ofcom fairness framework. Uh, thank you, uh, Peter. Yes. Um, so we're going to shift slightly from online harms and talk a little bit about customer fairness, but we're still talking about principles based regulation essentially so again knowing that that not everybody will be completely up to speed with the situation uh, in the uk uh, in 2019 uh, ofcom published a set of customer fairness commitments uh, and these commitments were a set of principles uh, and ofcom was clear that it expected all communication service providers in the uk would operate in line with these principles and they're the sort of things that you would imagine they would contain so they talk about things like treating customers fairly. They also talk about a uh, fair deal for customers. They talk about customers getting reliable products and services, uh, providers fixing things quickly and providing redress when things go wrong. Uh, they talk about enabling customers to make good choices, uh, to sign up for services and to leave services quickly and easily. And they also uh, talk about uh, communications providers providing support for customers in circumstances uh, that make them vulnerable. Um, and I think in doing that, in, in taking the initiative and putting out this, this clear set of expectations, I think Ofcom was doing two things. I mean, the, the first thing it was doing was obviously uh, recognizing quite rightly uh, that communication services are an increasingly important uh, set of services for everybody in our society. They're increasingly a gateway uh, to, to, to lots of other things and they matter in themselves as well. Um, and that people do expect uh, customers uh, themselves and others, especially those in vulnerable circumstances, um, to be treated fairly. But I think the other thing that Ofcom was doing at that point was recognizing the inherent difficulties of the notion of fairness. Um, you know, it does not lend itself to a clear, bright line definition. I mean, I was interested in the question earlier on about who decides harm. Well, I think Will is right. You, you ask the victims of harm. Uh, if you want to know what's fair, you know, stop somebody in the street and ask them what's fair and that they will have a view on that. They won't all have the same view um, and they won't all have the same view in six months time or 12 months time that they have today. And I think Ofcom was recognising uh, the fact that fairness doesn't lend itself to clear, bright line definitions and it doesn't lend itself uh, to an approach that is set in stone. It, it lends itself to a degree of fluidity uh, to reflect changes in societal expectations. I think the other thing that it was doing, again, 
absolutely rightly, uh, is recognizing that this is not an area where as a regulator, you want to be in the sort of territory where you're setting uh, minimum standards. I mean, you might need to do that, but really what you want to be doing is creating a regulatory environment that enables and encourages companies to do the right thing uh, for their customers. You want to be enabling and encouraging excellence, really, uh, the development uh, and rolling out uh, of best practice. And I think all of that suggested uh, at the time that the right way to go uh, was towards this more sort of principles uh, based uh, approach. And I completely agree with that. Um, the other thing that's worth noting as well with Ofcom's uh, customer fairness principles. Uh, was that not only was it a departure from the traditional, uh, more rule-based, more enforcement-based uh, telecoms uh, regulatory uh, approach uh, in the UK, it was also, um, you know, moving to principles-based regulation, but it was also a step in the direction of self-regulation, voluntary regulation. Uh, because what Ofcom did is it, it made the first move, it set out its thinking on these fairness principles, and then it took them to the communications providers and said, look, we think this is what society expects from you. Um, what do you think? Uh, are you happy to sign up to these? Are you happy to commit to these? And actually most of the large, in fact, I think all of the large communications providers in the UK said, yes, we are. Um, so it, not only is it a move from a more rules-based approach to a more principles-based approach, it's also a move in the direction of self-regulation, which again, I think reflects uh, the more sort of fluid uh, approach that, that Ofcom was seeking to take to this area, which was appropriate for the substance of it. Um, I think it's a great thing. I think it was a really good thing to do. Um, but it does raise some questions. It raises both challenges and opportunities. And I just want to jog through uh, some of those uh, now. We can maybe discuss them later on. Um, for companies, the obvious point, uh, and I speak as, as somebody who works for a telecoms company, um, it's a lot less clear what you have to do to comply. Um, you know, if, if you are used to having almost a sort of a checklist of things, and if you've done X and you've done Y, and you've done Z, you're fine. Uh, this is not that environment. Um, and I think that's precisely the advantage of it uh, as well. Um, so you have to recognize that. You also have to recognize that the goalposts will move over time. So you might do things that in, on day one, uh, you think are entirely in line with those fairness commitments, uh, and you might be right. And, but it's not right to assume that if you just carry on doing those things day in, day out for the next two or three years, you'll be fine in two or three years, because you might not be. Uh, the debate may have moved on, societal expectations uh, may have shifted, what good looks like may have shifted, what best practice looks like may have shifted. So it's very important, I think, to be, to be aware of that. And I think the other thing for companies, which sort of links with all of, of what I've just said, is that I think it's a big mistake to view principles-based regulation as what you might call light-touch regulation. Uh, I don't think it is a light-touch regulation, it's different touch uh, regulation. And I, I think companies would be in error uh, to assume that a principles-based regulatory regime uh, was in any way less onerous. I think in some ways it's more onerous and it puts more responsibility on companies to own how they operationalize those principles and how they internalize them uh, and to own uh, horizon scanning and wider stakeholder engagement to make sure that those principles remain current uh, as, as, as they go through. Um, so I think, you know, Lots of things, I think, for companies uh, to think about. Lots of things for regulators uh, to think about as well. Um, and I do think the move to principles-based regulation is a great opportunity uh, to move away from what you might call the sort of traditional regulatory approach of, you know, the regulator tells the company what's, what, what to do. And if the company doesn't do it, the regulator beats the company up. And we all rely on big financial penalties and deterrence effects. Um, and I think there's, there's quite a lot of literature out there, and any of you who are, who are familiar with the liter literature on ethical business regulation uh, will know this. There's quite a lot of literature out there that suggests that just doesn't work. You know, relying on big financial penalties, relying on deterrence effect, it, it, it just doesn't work. But this principles-based approach uh, does give us an opportunity to move away from that. But then the big question is, well, what are we moving towards? Um, and a principles-based approach does put the regulator in potentially quite a, diff a different position. And I think the big question for the regulator is, how do they know? How do you know that the companies that you regulate are doing the right thing? How do you know that they're really internalizing those principles uh, and, and, and taking them seriously? What do you look at? Uh, you know, are you going to look at outcomes? Are you going to look at process? Are you going to look at inputs? Are you going to look at culture? 
Um, probably you're gonna look at all of those things. Are some of them more important than others? Um, to what extent are you interested in creating KPIs uh, that would enable you to track things over time? Uh, to what extent are you interested in creating KPIs that would enable you to compare uh, different companies one with the other? How legitimate is that if the principles-based approach gives different companies uh, precisely the ability to operationalize those principles in different ways for their own groups of customers. Um, so there is quite a challenge there in terms of what the regulator needs to do in terms of making sure that it is properly assured uh, that the companies are, are taking those things uh, seriously. I think the other question, of course, for, for, for the regulator, and I sort of touched on it earlier on, is inevitably um, the regulator who has presided over these principles is going to get a barrage of requests uh, for those principles to be turned into more and more prescriptive guidance by companies uh, who want to know exactly what it is they have to do to comply. Um, and clearly there's a role for guidance. I don't think it's necessarily a problem uh, for regulators to give guidance. That can be very helpful. Um, but, you know, the regulator has to guard against companies taking the guidance as more important than the principles and complying with the, the specifics uh, that are given as, as sort of illustrations about what good looks like in the guidance at the expense of actually internalizing those principles. So again, interesting questions for regulators there about the balancing uh, act between principles and, and translating those into guidance. Um, I think there are big implications actually uh, of a principles-based approach for wider stakeholders. Um, and the extent to which uh, stakeholders beyond the regulator can use those principles to hold companies to account. And I think you know, it, it, it can be a very, very powerful mechanism. If you get the right principles that really resonate, for example, with the public and with civil society groups, um, and if you combine that with transparent, uh, accessible data about how companies are doing in respect to those principles, you potentially widen the scope uh, for companies to be held to account, not only by the regulator, but also by civil society groups and possibly even by individuals um, and certainly uh, by, by the press. Um, and that can actually create uh, a regime that is much more powerful than just the regulator sucking in information about whether the company is complying or not. Um, and so I think there, there is something there for wider civil society groups to think about. There is something there for the regulator to think about in terms of how they enable uh, that greater um, transparency. Uh, and I think that's quite quite an interesting phenomenon here. Um, I think finally, you know, the challenge with all of this, uh, and I think you've sort of picked it up from what I've said, is that the shift towards a principles-based approach, certainly in respect of, of this idea of, of, of customer fairness, um, is actually quite fundamental. It, it, it's not just a rewriting of the rule book. It requires a change in, in mindset a change in mindset of the companies, a change in mindset of the regulator, uh, and possibly a change in mindset of, of, of wider uh, civil society groups who can play that holding to account role. Um, and I think it, it, the thing can work and the thing can be incredibly powerful if people actually embrace that change in mindset uh, and understand really uh, what, what it's trying uh, to achieve. So, so, I mean, for my money, you know, what, one of the really good indicators uh, that this principles-based approach, which is still quite new in respect of consumer fairness, is actually working, is if we observe, you know, a lively, engaged, ongoing conversation, you know, between companies, between customer representatives, you know, other NGOs and the regulator um, about what fairness means in practice, about, um, you know, what best practice looks like, about whether things like front book, back book pricing, uh, for example, uh, is a problem. Uh, because, you know, these things are not clear, bright lines. And not only are they not clear, bright lines, there are sometimes trade-offs um, between things that we would think were, were, were good for customers. So, you know, we might not like the idea that customers that come out of contracts uh, are charged higher prices. And that's been an issue in the UK that's been raised by, by Citizens Advice. Uh, but equally, we also know that we like competition. Competition produces good things uh, for customers. And that, you know, if a customer is coming to the end of their contract and you know, they get a notification from their operator that their price is going up, um, then they're very likely to engage with the market. They're likely to go and search out a best deal. And that has positive effects for everybody. So there are trade-offs there between things that we think are good uh, for customers. And I think if, if this principles-based approach 
uh, on customer fairness um, is, is really working, what we'll see is a lively, engaged, ongoing conversation about that that then translates into uh, best practice uh, and then eventually uh, a degree uh, of withholding to account. So I think you know, one of the things I'm really interested to understand as we watch the embedding of this, this consumer fairness approach in, in, in telecoms is, if I can put it this way, how the sector together uh, is moving up that maturity matrix. You know, it would be really interesting. I don't know if Ofcom did this, but it would be really interesting uh, to go back to the sort of baseline of, of some sort of a maturity model um, in this space from, let's say, 2018, before they put the, uh, the principles out there, and then come back uh, in maybe three or five years' time and, and see how we're all doing uh, against that. Because it is, it is quite a radical departure, but I think it's 100% the right thing to do. Uh, so I shall stop there and we can, uh, we can discuss. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, do any of the other speakers want to comment on this topic? Yeah, Peter, I wouldn't mind uh, uh, sharing my thoughts to, to Catherine's talk. Um, so I find a very interesting set of thoughts, Catherine, and that sort of iterative open dialogue element of that message is, is extremely powerful. Um, just to pick up a couple of points that you mentioned, uh, in my mind, that sort of monitoring outcomes and looking what the market is delivering for consumers uh, resonates really strongly. And it kind of goes back to the point Will was mentioning earlier. Ultimately, it's about how people experience the market and we want to be alive to that. So looking at outcomes, in my mind, is sort of an essential puzzle of the piece here when we think about fairness in telecoms. And I think looking at these outcomes, uh, the way we should do that is in, in a very broad sense of the word, broad, both in terms of what we look at, and it can be final outcomes, processes, sort of all of the metrics that you set out. But it's also broad in the sense of who we talk to. Um, and as you suggest, that bringing into that conversation, not just the regulator and the telecom companies, but a much broader st set of stakeholders beyond that as well. But outcomes and, and sort of looking at what's happening in the market is only one element of this process. And I think uh, what's then important is if there are emerging issues that are being raised to really use our fairness principles and our fairness framework to start a conversation. Um, and what's important in my mind, uh, uh, about the fairness framework is it imposes some structure to that conversation, a structure to the conversation that will, first of all, help us understand why we're seeing the outcomes that we're seeing, and also how those outcomes might be different depending on which consumer group you're looking at. And you hinted at it earlier, uh, Catherine, about uh, vulnerable users, and we know from market research that the stresses that come with illness, for example, can make it harder for people to engage with the market and therefore finding the deal that's good for them. And that's true for that, for that set of people, but that doesn't need to be true, generally the case. Now, the second thing that the framework allows us to do is to really think through all of the impacts that a potential intervention can have. And that is important because um, while you might be targeting at trying to help a particular set of customers to address a fairness issue that they deal with, you can't be blind to potential knock-on effects that those interventions might have, for example, on innovation incentives for telecom providers. And so what's important uh, for me in terms of that conversation is that we identify all of those impacts try and minimize any unintended consequences that we might generate or where we can't do that to make that trade-off very explicit and conscious. Now, a second thing that I think the framework allows us to do is that it gives some helpful guidelines and pointers for companies to take a bit more responsibility themselves to think about tackling issues before they arise. Um, and I think the, the framework does that in two ways. I think, first of all, um, it points to a number of factors that we might take into account if we were to ever come to a stage of an assessment um, and how those factors might ultimately feed into an assessment of whether an outcome is fair or not. And going back to our, our um, vulnerable users, um, you know, as a regulator, we might be more concerned about an outcome if that outcome is achieved by um, 
almost abusing behavioral biases that vulnerable users have to then uh, extract a higher price from them. I think the second thing that a framework allows us to do as well is to articulate how we might trade off different impacts of intervention or how we might take into account those different impacts. And I think a good example here is uh, some of the things we set out in our fairness framework around investment. And particularly what we say there is um, we might be less concerned to intervene in, on, on, a, on a fairness basis in markets where that are sort of quite mature, where demand and costs are quite stable, and where investments probably have been monetized already. Um, and then the opposite is also true, might be slightly more concerned or, or a bit more hesitant to intervene in markets which are emerging um, if that has a potential to discourage investment down the line. And I'll pause there. Thank you. Um, do William or Oliver want to comment on this one? I'm a trustee of Good Things Foundation, which is a charity that works in thousands of tiny community centers around the country to give people access, often for the first time, to the digital technologies they need from modern life. And uh, we observed before lockdown, but of course during lockdown, that we were at the position where people were spending, choosing to spend their money on data or on other essentials, um, a pretty tricky position they were in. And I do hope that, and I was very, well, I was very pleased to see that Ofcom reactivated something that had almost been forgotten about, um, the so-called social tariffs, the access tariffs, the incredibly low cost means of just being able to connect to networks. These of course had their origins back in the old days when telephones were very expensive compared to average incomes, had largely been forgotten about, but it was now is exactly the right time to bring back interest in that because it's a structural fairness issue really for Britain as a society uh, that people should be able to have access to the digital technologies they need to live their life. And during lockdown, Good Things has, has delivered um, you know, many, many devices to people of usually elderly, elderly isolated people to enable them to connect with their families during this terrible time. So that's changed the, the lens through which, might change the lens a bit through which we see fairness. And then on a slightly um, uh, uh, more detached note as well, I'm always struck that um, we the, the best solutions will be found by companies and the regulator talking about things. Um, and there is this quite rightly tension, I suppose, with the Competition Act that companies sh shouldn't be talking together too much, otherwise they look a bit like a cartel. Um, so I always keep reminding policymakers to think about that, to ensure that the regulator can provide a space within which big organizations can talk together without accusations of cartelization. Um, it's a fine area, but it can be something that inhibits dialogue between companies, as well as all the normal competitive reasons that companies don't like to talk to the enemy, as it were. Thank you. Oliver. Uh, just a, a, a very quick comment. Uh, you know, I um, again very very interesting comments. I, I agree with much of what's been said. I I think sometimes this uh, the the dichotomy, and Will, I think you touched on this in your opening remarks. Also, the dichotomy between the principles and the checklist approach. Because the truth is, is as you all know, when I'm advising in house, and as every in house lawyer does, I say there's a fairness rule out here, and they say, well, okay. <laughs> what's the checklist, right? What do I need to do? Particularly if you're working with engineers who won't take very much on trust. So these things, you know, oftentimes I think what can start with, a, you know, I think that the principle can inform a discussion at a very high level, as, as we're saying, I think today about the idea of outcome, where, we, where do we want to head with this? And this is not, I, I stress this, and we make this very clear within Google, certainly on the European in-house team, this is not a a decision that you can take internally. Google can't decide what is the fair outcome for European consumers. You need to be part of a consensus around that. That's very clear to us. Um, but once you've had that discussion, of course, you do move to this next phase to say, well, okay, we have this product launch next week. How does the new fairness principle apply? And that will be reducible to some form of metrics, some form of deck, some form of decision-making process. And I think that the real opportunity for us is that if you can establish a relationship of trust with an agency that doesn't look like a cartel, well, you know, I take that point well, or doesn't look like, let's be very honest, right? big technology companies are accused of lobbying, so it can't look like that also. It needs to look like, it also needs to look like a, a, a real conversation. You know, there needs to be a, an evidence-based debate. And I think 
if you do create that kind of space and, and, and the trust within the company, trust with engineers, they will be prepared to discuss those kinds of checklists. I think you can start to talk a common language and say, well, we have a fairness principle discussion with the agency, the enforcer. Um, they'll want to discuss how we're making our decisions. They want to see our data, but this is not a trial. This is not an adversarial conversation. This is not about trying to find out if we did something wrong. It's about trying to understand how we do it. And, and that's the space where I think that there are real opportunities for companies like Google because um, you know it, it doesn't. It's not a great use of resource to make to take risks in those decisions when you could have had a conversation to wait five years and to take that big fine, Catherine. You know it, it doesn't make sense. Why not use the resource earlier in the process to try and find a solution that's going to avoid that? Oliver, thank you. And uh, actually, speaking of companies like uh, Google, there's a, a nice question from Ian Struhl, uh, which is the following. Uh, does a principles-based approach mean that large companies can more easily afford to engage and employ many expert minds and even AI systems to automate principles intelligence, whereas small players won't be able to afford to comply and won't be able to handle the regulatory unknowns? I'm not sure about the, there, there, there are plenty of expert minds, I'm not one of them. I, <laughs> I, 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 um, I think that there is a, a risk of that. It, uh, and I think it particularly emerges if you, I mean, I can think of a very practical, I can give a practical example. Um, in search ranking, for example, you, I, I can imagine a world, I would, like, my vision is a world where I can engage with the agencies that are, and look across large data sets and try and identify, let's say, unfair ranking decisions, have an agreement as to what that might look like so I can try and avoid them. That's a very practical example of how I would imagine regulatory dialogue to be to our benefit and to, to everyone's benefit. Um, that kind of resource that's needed for those kinds of discussions, both at the agency and at Google, is significant, that's clear. Uh, now, I, I think one, of way, one way of solving that is, has been touched on already by Catherine, which is transparency in the process. I think if you can uh, anchor these discussions um, on metrics that you are prepared to share, um, discussions that you are prepared to have with the other industry stakeholders, there is the place for us all to understand what's being discussed and what decisions are being taken, as far as that's possible. But also for other stakeholders, the new search engine, the new entrants, they do exist, I assure you, for them to understand how these decisions are being taken and to say, listen, this is not something that is viable for us um, at, 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 uh, at our scale. So we'll need to think about a more practical solution. So I do think that those kinds of discussions um, make sense. Uh, and I'll pause on this. I think it's something that's worth bearing in mind as one looks across the panoply of new regulation that will attach to the company I work for and a handful of others. I think there will be other companies who will find themselves in similar situations. The Digital Markets Act envisages emerging gatekeepers in its text. And when you think about the level of investment that will be required to comply with some of these rules, I think you have to be aware of the scope of the rules on a forward-looking basis when you're writing them. Mm. Peter, can I can I just come in on that? Because I, I I think it's a really interesting question. I I I think I, I shall sort of do a little bit of full disclosure. I I, I work for BT, but but one thing I do uh, in my sort of spare time is I'm I'm the chair of something called the Regulatory Horizons Council um, for government, and our job is basically to look at technological innovation and ask the question, how can regulatory reform change to enable that technological innovation to deliver the best value for the UK? Which isn't actually, we're not mostly focused on tech regulation, quote unquote, we're looking at things like fusion energy and genetic technologies and things like that. But one of the things we hear a lot when we talk to startup companies, innovators, disruptors, you know, the, these sorts of people is that they, they do generally seem to prefer, and I'm generalizing, but they do generally seem to prefer a principles-based approach to a rule-based approach, because the more prescriptive you get, the more likely it is that those prescriptive rules that you're looking at will be perfectly crafted to deal with today's technology and today's incumbents at the expense of people who just do things differently. So actually, if you've got a principle that can be operationalized in different ways, possibly using different techniques and, and, and more sort of disruptive technologies, I think you're more likely to reduce the entry barriers than you are to, to, to increase it. But that's just uh, my take wearing a slightly different hat. I do wonder if there's scope as well in that kind of regulatory theory um, to look at um, emerging problems and acting rather quicker 
with a principles-based approach before you go in all heavy-handed with a rules-based approach, lots of fines attached to it. I, I lived through as a civil servant the beef on the bone crisis um, and the GM foods crisis when I was private secretary of the science minister. And uh, we were, we, uh, the regulatory regime was sort of paralyzed because it didn't have enough evidence. It wasn't prepared to act on indicative evidence and move quickly uh, and regulate and allow companies to continue doing their thing that might be hazardous under light touch regulatory supervision until we understood it better. And so as a result, things were banned. GM food was banned, uh, GM, GM crops were banned, sorry. Um, and that was not good for, for our scientific development in my view. So there is a sense of, can you quickly, and I've also spotted Ofcom in the past doing forbearance saying we will not regulate until a certain threshold is met. And then at that point, we might consider regulating. So this sense of saying, giving companies a warning signal that something might happen. But to go back to that very good point about smaller companies, um, it's a bit old fashioned in some ways, but you know, traditionally trade associations and small companies banding together to share knowledge um, it has been a very strong way of doing it. Tech UK is pretty good, but we see in lots of more traditional sectors, a very strong role of trade associations uh, to help people understand the direction of regulatory travel. But Proportionality must be all. Um, if you're a small product and you and you have a low risk approach, then you shouldn't be touched much by the regime. But it should be transparent to you that when your product becomes risky, um, that you need to do things to de-risk it, um, and you should design for that right at the outset rather than waiting until it's too late. Um, and, and to sort of build on that a little bit, um, I think there is. Uh, maybe also an opportunity there for regulators to encourage, um, for example, um, advisory markets uh, coming up in, in online harms or online safety bill. The idea could be a, uh, a, a safety tech sector that builds some of the shelf solutions that smaller players can plug and play rather than having to have long lengthy conversations to make sure they're aligned. There is sort of a a market for them to tap into and with minimal effort kind of adhere to those rules and I think that's a really interesting concept uh, and then also again point about proportionality and that goes back to the point I was trying to land earlier which is the framework is also there for us to intervene where we think in on the whole that's the right thing to do um, uh, and maybe as part of that thinking you want to understand what the impact on smaller players might be and uh, you want to avoid that impact um, I don't know under undermining competition in a way that leads to much bigger problems down the line well we did have another question um, on um, you know what happens when com companies breach principles I mean, what what is the action taken and I think in fact uh, you guys have managed to answer it implicitly in what you said about the last question and in view of the time, we actually probably need to move to you now, Tanya, for you to make your own presentation. Brilliant. Thanks, Peter. Um, so when I was asked to first uh, present on principles and rules, um, it took me a moment to think a little bit what my way in would be. Um, and I think my starting point is that the distinction between rules and principles is perhaps not quite as stark as it's sometimes put out there. And I think there's two reasons for that. First of all, if you think about a rules versus a principles in terms of how prescriptive you are in your requirements, then really what you're talking about is a spectrum rather than a bright line that distinguishes the two. So for example, if you impose friend terms, is that a principle or is that a rule? Some probably somewhere in the middle. And the second reason why I think this distinction is not necessarily that stark is that rules and principles can be used at the same time to really complement each other, to have a single regulatory strategy which uh, draws on the strength of both. And it strikes me that competition law and merger control are a good example of that, uh, a good example of where principles and rules are combined so that we can draw on the strengths of each of them. So let's think of the significant listing of competition tests in merger control in the UK. It's not a bright line. Um, it's not like you take a merger and you go, okay, it passes or it doesn't. No, what we need to do is the SLC test, if you like, gives us a framework to assess mergers and to decide whether they're problematic. 
based and taking into account the specifics of the case. And that's where the principle is really powerful because not all, all mergers are problematic. And really what we want our principle to do, we want it to allow us to take into account the specifics of a case to only intervene where it's necessary, i.e. where there is a problem and where there is a harm. Um, if you take a, an example of a rule, and, and here I'm thinking of object infringements like, like price fixing, for example, then here it does make sense to have a brighter line rule. But re because really what you're saying is economic theory tells us that price fixing has, uh, is very likely to lead to harm. So um, we can draw a bright line. And if you can draw a bright line, then that is also helpful to be very clear with companies Kind of articulate to them what is and what isn't allowed. Now, ultimately, um, you want companies to adhere to your rules, you know, or your principles, whichever form you choose for. And in principle, things like fines or cost of investigations or reputational damage can sometimes be enough of a motivator for companies to adhere to the requirements that you put to them. But inevitably, uh, there's going to be enforcement involved, right? Um, and regardless of whether you have rules or principles, enforcement is always going to have an element of taking the specifics of the case and, and applying them to the requirements you've put in place. And it's probably fair to say that that process for a regulator is more cumbersome in the case of a principle. Um, because it's not like you have a bright line rule and you can assess whether someone was on the left or on the right. Um, you need to work a little harder to build up a, if you like, theory of harm and evidence that, and then make the link to how that evidence supports the fact that a principle was not met. And that's not necessarily a, a bad thing. Um, it imposes discipline on us as regulators to clearly articulate what we think the problem is, to evidence that that problem arose and that harm came from it. Um, and that's important because it means that we're going to focus on intervening where there is a good case to, to do so. Now, obviously, if behavior is very egregious, and I'm, I'm sort of thinking back to the price fixing example, then in those cases, there's fairly little value in putting a lot of effort on theories of harm and collecting evidence. We know from economic theory that that's harmful behavior. So in those cases, it's much better to have a simple rule. Um, assess whether the behavior broke that rule or not, and then end it. And then the final point I wanted to pick up, uh, and something that strikes me as kind of helpful parallel from competition line merger control, is that in this sphere, we have a number of tools to help us deal with some of the shortcomings that you get from both principles and rules based approaches. So, on the principle side, I think it's sometimes said that principles. Uh, can lack clarity and, and sort of can lack certainty for companies in terms of whether they're adhering to the rules or not. And I think earlier we already uh, referred to guidelines and how they can be a tool for regulators to explain how they might approach cases. And that can be one way in which we can facilitate understanding and interpretation of the principles. Um, other tools that we can have are enforcement decisions or appeals where um, over time, you start getting trends and uh, a bit more clarity about how the specifics of a case can ultimately feed into whether a, a principle was broken or not. I think a second element that uh, principle-based regulations sometimes get blamed for is this idea that it's almost too broad. It's almost capturing too much of the behavior that's out there. Um, and kind of the challenge that that can then become really cumbersome because you're you might be capturing behavior that's really not that harmful at all. And here as well, I think we've got an interesting tool uh, to point to. And I'm, I'm thinking, for example, about the safe harbors that we have or some vertical restraints um, that do not fall on sort of the more principle-based pr prohibition on concerted practices. And on the rules-based of the side, uh, the rules side uh, um, of the conversation, uh, here, sometimes what you hear is that rules can generate unintended consequences if they're sort of too bright lined. Um, and here again, I think uh, there's ways for us to manage that. And an example of that is rebuttable presumptions. 
So um, there might be occasions where we want to almost set a rule and say, if you engage in this behavior, uh, it's likely to be illegal unless you can show X or Y. So in this case, you have a rule, but it's a bit bendy. Um, essentially, you allow the company or the stakeholder more generally to make the case on why in their specific behavior, uh, the rule is not, does not apply. And here I'm thinking, for example, of uh, the, the rebuttable presumption around exclusivity inducing payments by nominant firms. It's sort of presumed to be illegal unless a company can show that foreclosure effects um, were not materialized when they were using such payments. So really, where does that leave us? Um, I think where I sort of sit on the spectrum is that ultimately there's, there's no clear bright line rule, if you like, uh, that can tell us whether we should be using principles or we should be using rules. In my mind, what's important is that we understand what the harms are that we're trying to address and to understand whether they are so obviously there that we can use a rule because, you know, you, you engage in the behavior really um, in most cases that behavior will be harmful. And in those cases, a rule can be very powerful. Or where we're in a situation where the behavior can sometimes be harmful, sometimes not, it depends on circumstances. And in those cases, a principle is much more powerful because it allows us, first of all, uh, to only intervene where the behavior did generate a harm. And it also gives us a framework to then conduct an assessment to understand whether that was the case or not. Do, do other speakers want to comment on these uh, these issues? I'm happy to. Yeah, I'm happy to do it very very quickly. Thanks a lot, Tanya. It's uh, super interesting. I think the, the notion of a of a rebuttable presumption is is one that comes up and always interests me. It's one of those one of those expressions that if if we used to ask the same person who we would ask had asked about what's what's fairness. They may understand this if we say, "Well, do you think it's a, we should have a rebuttable presumption?" They would scratch their head and certainly think we were speaking something, saying something strange. But I, I think that the notion of rebuttable presumption, as I think of it, is really that we've seen this conduct a few times now. It's typically bad, and and what's more, it has some attributes that we agree are typically associated with this badness. And, and I think it can be useful. I agree with you, Tanya. I think that you know, in, in some sense, the earlier question was was a very good one. The many senses the what is a harm because really as just as when we have a sort of spectrum of you know from strict per se rule through to a forward-looking principle uh so too the harms they map one to the other right? i think the nature of the harm if, if we're in the world where that harm is something that we all recognize well it's obvious on its face we, we know that we don't want people to do that because we've experienced it a lot and it hurts then put it in the world of a of a, of a presumption, why rebuttable, right? I, 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 so I, I think that there's a, a neat mapping of the two. And yet, as you move away from the, the things that we know to be typically harm, that we think worth looking at and paying attention to, because they're gonna be important to the contestability of a, of a market we all care about, then the principle we deploy. And I think this, this notion of spectrums, and as we look at the nature of both the harm and the remedial measure is, is something that's very appealing to me as I think about this. Catherine? Oh, yes, you do. Thanks yeah, uh, I, 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 I thought what you had to say was really interesting, Tanya. And, I, and one of the things I was thinking as you were talking was, you know, I, I, I think you're absolutely right to, to, to sort of posit this idea of a spectrum of approaches and it isn't binary, it's either rules based or principles based, there's a whole spectrum there. The, the, the thing that I was sort of pondering as you, as you were saying that was, was also about the, the sort of the fact that it isn't just about rules based or principles based. There are a whole set of things uh, that go with where you decide to be on that spectrum. So I was super interested in your point about the importance of transparency in decision making by regulators. I think that's absolutely right. Uh, it's always important if regulators are, are doing cases, enforcement cases for them to be important. Uh, to, for, it will always be important to, for them to say why they've made the decision that they've made. But I think when you've got a principles based system it's really really important that as the regulator makes a decision about enforcing a principle it it tracks the behavior back to the principle so that everybody reading the decision can learn and understand more about what the principles mean so i i, I found myself wondering whether at some point it might be worth sort of unpacking the toolkit 
um, along dimensions that aren't just sort of principles through to rule based, but also about the different aspects of behavior, um, you know, within the regulator, within the company, whatever, um, that, that give you sort of different sets of choices as to where you are on those different spectrums and how you put together a regulatory approach, because some of those things will be very complementary and some of them might be intention. Some of them might help you regulate more effectively and some of them might cut across each other. It was very, very interesting uh, talk. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. just to pick up both on Oliver and Catherine's point, yeah, and in my mind, there's also potentially an element of dynamics here, right, and, and Oliver, you almost hinted at it, um, if you're seeing behavior and repeatedly you see that it's generating harm, does that start to look like something that potentially you want to turn something in, something a bit more towards the rules spectrum, because through history, you've learned that there's an issue there that needs solving. Um, and that, that kind of goes to your point as well, Catherine, where if consistently true cases, you keep repeating the same analysis again, it's bringing you to the same conclusion that there is an issue that is maybe a little bit of a hint there that you can you can move a bit more towards that rules based um, creating clarity for companies, but also um, um, allowing the regulator to more make more efficient use of, of the resources they have. Um, I, I, Tanya, I thought you, you you nailed it right at the end, uh, where you talked about um, where you essentially got round to the issue that bedevils us in the online safety space, which is context, um, because something is contextual, whether something is harmful or not is highly contextual. And then this leads me on to a half form thought, which is very much for Catherine and the regulatory horizons thing, which sounds a bit like a 1980s holiday company, but perhaps that, that's just me, this horizons. Um, the is this uh, the so much regulation has been predicated on the 1980s utility experience uh, where we had 30 million households uh, and then in other areas like financial services you have 50 odd million customers um, and uh, you have to address them as a, almost as a, as a mass you can't really finally differentiate between individual experiences but in the online internet safety space we have companies that by their sheer brilliance have been able to address every single person differently um, within then that's the whole point of the product in many ways and so there's an interesting challenge which um, I doubt that someone has written on I just haven't read it yet on how you manage that in a regulatory space for this sense of um, each individual will have a an outcome that is differently referenced by regulation and that is the modern condition and that is a massive structural shift for regulatory thinking that, uh, as I said, I'm sure someone has written about this. It's just, it's just occurred to me because I'm a bit slow, um, maybe, that this is something that is intriguing. And so how does one almost frame, as a marketeer would, um, uh, those, um, uh, what's the, the, the old one was, yes, I, I, want to, I want to go to speak to cellists in Wellingborough, um, who, who are women between 32 and 45, um, is a thing that is now possible to do with advertising tools. And so their regulator experience and the outcome for them will be different because of the complexity of that set product set. So fascinating set of issues there. But I really think you can only address them by principles, but you do have to then work out through some sort of framing exercise or matrixing what those experiences are across a range of social um, uh, divisional stereotypes or whatever they may be. In fact, really if anyone has seen writing on that, I'd love to have it referenced in the, in the sidebar. That's a really interesting idea, Will, uh, because personalization also generates really good things for all of us, right? And um, when you're intervening in that space, you don't wanna, uh, you wanna keep the good stuff, you wanna get rid of the bad stuff. Um, and I think that that's an, a challenge that we need to have in the back of our minds as well when we, when we intervene online. And, and to your point, yeah, everyone's got a different experience. How do we make sure that we uh, capture those groups that might be relatively small, but are, are experiencing intense harms? How do we make sure that we spot them and um, have a proportionate approach, of course, as always, but, but make sure that where there is a proportionate approach to help them, that that, that happens. Um, and I think that's where I think we're in an exciting world. Um, data is great for day-to-day -day business, but I think data is also great for us as a regulator to help us make good decisions and collect evidence towards the policies that we make. Um, so really an exciting time, I think, in terms of uh, what we can do as a regulator with, with uh, the progress that's being made online. Thank you, Tanya. Um, there's uh, an interesting question from uh, Lara Stoymanova, um, which is, 
whether we talk about an online harm or a fairness issue, swift re resolution uh, will be key to the, to the victim, the user of the service. And the question is whether this swiftness of re resolution uh, may be adversely affected in a principle-based regulation regime. Does anyone have thoughts on that? Can, can right. I maybe come in on some of that? Because I, I, I think there's a, there's a relevance there to what Will was saying uh, uh, earlier on as well, which is, I, I, I just want to sort of challenge a little bit whether in that sort of world, um, you know, the right thing to do is to rely on the harm, you know, being given effect to becoming apparent, you know, the issue being raised, redress being put in place, you know, that 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 is that that is very ex post, you know, and and will always be subject to some degree of time lag. Although maybe we can have a discussion about how you might reduce that time lag. But I was thinking when Will was talking, you know, earlier that that this is really why the whole sort of conduct based approach to regulation um, is really fruitful in this area because no regulator is ever going to see every instance of harm. It's just, you know, especially when it's contextual, when it's crafted to individuals. So, so a sort of set of principles where the regulator or where society via the regulator is able to set out how companies should behave in order to make sure that actually they probably won't create harm, not guarantee, but probably won't create harm, is probably going to be a more fruitful approach. And that, that, is, that is going to be a principles-based approach, but it then goes back to that conversation we were having earlier on about what does that then mean for the regulator or is receiver of assurance that that company's culture, systems, processes, capabilities are set up in the right way that mean in its DNA, it probably won't uh, actually create too much harm. I think there's a different approach and there's a different lens I'd look at that through. Thank you. Does anybody else want to weigh in on that one? Yeah, I wouldn't mind adding to that. Um, yeah, I agree with that, Catherine. The, the kind of ideas, uh, the goal of online harms is to prevent the harm from occurring in the first place rather than trying to expose, solve it. Um, and on top of that, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, we'll have several regulatory levers, if you like, to deal with harm. And one of them is what we call media literacy. And what media literacy might help us to do is to try and also minimize the impact of exposure to harmful content, for example. Um, and here you might think at, of um, ensuring that someone that does get exposed to self-harm content, to kind of reach them the tools to help them deal with that content. Um, and then the second dimension we have of the online harms regime is a strong emphasis on what's called uh, user redress, that ability for the user to uh, raise with companies um, um, that, that either they've seen harmful content or that where their, their video was raised as harmful content and taken down, they have that ability to reinstate it. So if you like the online harms kind of logic is to empower users to protect themselves from either harm, being exposed to harmful content or um, you know, excessive intrusions in their, their experience of freedom of expression. Certainly in the work Professor Woods and I did, um, once we sort of got our heads around the scale of operations, we said that individuals should not be able to bring individual cases to Ofcom. Uh, and we did not really propose an ombuds process simply because the scale is almost too big uh, for these who actually work realistically. The real key was to get better resolution systems working uh, because they're an, I, I within the companies uh, as they are the, the most appropriate routes to um, for people to seek redress but we uh, in some ways we felt that we were being rather callous but we felt the scale was so colossal that um, sort of an individualist approach um, would essentially just create a vast machine that wouldn't work very well. Well as an aside the scale of the ombudsman scheme and of the compensation scheme relating to financial services is amazingly large, you know, including by international standards. Um, I recently did some work which showed that the compensation scheme was an almost inconceivable multiple of the size of the Irish scheme, for example. Well, um, you're very creative speakers, because yet again, we've run out of time. 
So I, I think it's uh, Oliver's turn now to lead us through the final session of, of the event. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, final session today. So uh, let me uh, let me take us into Google and talk about some of the decisions that we take on a, a day to day basis. And perhaps as we go, you know, we can use it as something of a case study to, to think about how these things could be categorized as rules or principles. I think you'll find very much from what I described to you that there is a blurring. We act, we behave in a, in a spectrum, I think. Um, so I guess imagine, if you will, you're in Google, sitting in a sunny office, probably, matcha latte in hand, uh, staring at a whiteboard with some uh, irritating law like me, probably in a, a VC screen somewhere advising you uh, on an issue. What would be the issue of the day? Well, let me pick one, which is self-preferencing, favoring, uh, vertical integration. That's the, the issue that I'll, uh, I'll sort of hinge my remarks on today. Uh, it's a well-known concern at this point, the concern at its core is that Google is a, a dominant, very dominant search engine. And what we do on the search engine results by adding results from specialized services that we compete to, to, to compete in various verticals, travel, shopping, local, by positioning our services within the search results, that gives us an unfair advantage. That's the self-preferencing theory as one variant of it as it manifests within our company, an issue we have to think about on, on a daily basis. Uh, uh, it cuts across various verticals, of course. The, uh, the um, most famous example of intervention is the, the European Commission shopping case. And there we had a, a, a long investigation where the uh, Commission took uh, uh, a close look at Google's decision to integrate shopping results and search results and came to the conclusion that there was a problem, clearly. Uh, as you look at the Commission's decision, um, as I'm sure many of you have done, it's broken out to, it's a long decision, but it's broken out into to quite reasonable sort of evidentiary categories of review. Of course, I disagree with where they come out on various other points, but you can understand the way in which the debate has been framed. You look at the nature of uh, the impact on the market. What has a, has a particular launch done in terms of traffic to Google, Google service and traffic to other people's services? There, for example, a very good example of a, of a data point that is very recognizable for engineers within Google. For us as a team, we understand that metric and we may disagree with the interpretation, but there's an example of a, a readily identifiable metric. What has been the impact on uh, the market? Uh, and there, a, a further analysis, which of course you're very familiar with, what's been the effect more generally? What were the alternatives that are available to some of the competitors who may have lost traffic uh, in, this particular, in this particular example? And finally, how, how reasonable was the decision that Google took? And here we've sort of pushed back into a world of principles. This is in the shopping decision very much based on the documents, your interpretation of, of, uh, of what was uh, before the commission, but a determination made there as to the reasonableness of a, of a decision, decision that was taken by Google. What did we do with that <clears throat> shopping decision after we received it? Well, to be quite frank, and coming back to the our earlier uh, discussion, Catherine, around, chest, around checklists, we reduce it to a checklist. That precedent, establishes a broad principle of no self-preferencing in search and underlying it, thanks in part to a, a painful decision, but thanks to that decision, nevertheless, <clears throat> a set of components, tests, that you as, a, as an in-house lawyer can talk to your engineers about. And that forms the basis of, of, of search guidelines that we use within the company, not formally described as such, but when we have conversations around vertical launches today, people know that I'm the shopping guy and that I ask particular questions. And they tend to focus on uh, the following three things. Can we demonstrate a demonstrable value add from this integration? That was very important in the shopping decision. I need metrics and evidence to be able to take to a regulator to discuss that particular idea. <clears throat> what modes of inclusion have we provided for our competitors? A very real metric that we can evidence and, and bring to regulators born of the principles of the shopping decision. <clears throat> and finally, user choice. Fairness by design. Have we let, excuse me, <clears throat> have we let our consumers know that there are alternatives to the search services that we're integrating within our search results? So there you see, <clears throat> I hope, the, the principle of a, the principle of a, a, as a trend in competition law manifests in a decision that has particular evidentiary components, which we then as a company have translated into a set of principles and rules that we apply on a daily basis. And it probably comes as no surprise to you 
that I think that gives you a good framework for how you talk to agencies more generally about these kinds of concerns in the future. Um, it gives you a very helpful framework. It has been argued, nevertheless, that the antitrust rules are not sufficient for this kind of analysis moving forward. The shopping case took too long. That is very familiar to all of you. That's the primary uh, criticism I think that people have. It features in the, the uh, Furman report, it features in the CMA market study, it features in a lot of the um, publications, documentations around the, the digital markets. Act. These, these cases take too long. The remedies are too slow to come to market. We need to move faster. Now this gives me pause because as I hear these concerns, as someone who worked through the 10 years or so of that case, I can tell you that some of the reasons for delay are not for a substantive failure in the, the test that we were working within. There are many things that could have led to better outcomes that were procedural fixes. So I think this one observation I have here is that some of the principles and rules that we might want to deploy to gain better outcomes may be as mundane as tighter processes, you know, clearer rules for defendants and agencies as to how much time they can spend on commitments negotiations, uh, a faster turnaround on the decision, a quicker filtering of concerns. There are some procedural principles I would submit that can address uh, the, uh, the speed of the procedure if that is a motivating factor to move to new principles and rules. Uh, nevertheless, <clears throat> we haven't adopted that model and there are various approaches that are now being proposed to think about how we can better supervise, scrutinize these kinds of launch decisions at Google, particularly in, in, in vertical search, which is my example. Um, in the, the UK, the DMU, we see taking an approach which I think more or less maps to how we're thinking about vertical search launches. Let's establish a set of principles, overarching principles. Let's sit under that, a code of conduct, which will allow us to discuss with engineers from time to time, someone like Ollie, but probably more my engineers, what are the key metrics and parameters that are going to inform our discussion. Um, and let's have a, a discussion around the metrics, but let's keep the, the sharp edge of enforcement at the end of that process. These people need to come to the table with data, real data, they need to make time and they need to listen to the recommendations that we provide. That seems to me a sensible framework, to be quite frank. Uh, the approach in the Digital Markets Act is somewhat different, has flavours, it's early days, so it's hard to say where this will land, but it has flavours of uh, the approach in the UK. We start from a principle, a principle, uh, one of the articles establishes a principle against self-preferencing, so far so good. Um, I think one of the, the, the key differences from our perspective, one important difference is that the principle as enshrined in the DMA is immediately applicable. So our liability triggers, a failure to comply with the principle triggers a liability for us, which puts us in an interesting position because if one is willing and, and able to engage and to discuss the types of decisions you're taking and the metrics and data you're relying on, you're less incentivized to do that if you know that you're immediately triggering liability if you fail to make the grade. And that, that, that gives me some hesitation. I think it's, uh, it's good to have space. I think there's a risk, of course, that those processes are used strategically. I can understand that concern, but I think you can perhaps address that through procedural fixes. So I think that there's a, uh, uh, you know, perhaps uh, an opportunity for more debate around that particular provision. I, I, I will say this, the, the recital to the uh, self-preferencing provisions in the Digital Markets Act do contain a, a rather stricter rule, in, in my read at least, which is a, a prohibition against uh, differentiated treatment. So I have home time behind me, so I have some screaming children, I'm sorry about that. Uh, there is a, a, an additional rule, I would say, in the preamble, the recitals that lead into the draft proposal uh, for the Digital Markets Act, where differentiated treatment is prohibited. That's a clear rule, no differentiated treatment of your services. I think it's a difficult and dangerous rule that will have unintended consequences. I think if you tip on an issue like self-preferencing, which merits scrutiny, does merit uh, a discussion of the kinds of data that we're relying on, analysis of our decisions, I understand that, but I think a prohibition on differentiated treatment risks blocking product launches because it's clear in its face that you can't treat yourself differently and there will be clearly instances of integration decisions that Google will take where its service will be differentiated for very good reasons. The database sits on our servers, we can understand the, the organization of the data in a way that we can't for other people's databases, for example. So I have some, some concerns about uh, some of those uh, stricter rules and uh, as you can tell us a preference for more of a principles based approach when it comes to a principles based approach uh, with the underpinning of metrics when it comes to search decisions. 
Um, I hope this is not too disrupting. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have some, uh, yeah, you got this. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, uh, very briefly, because I think I'm almost at time, I wanted to touch on another issue, another area where principles and rules are, are often um, being discussed, and that's around the issue of data portability, interoperability, data disclosures. I think from our perspective, it is very difficult uh, to have that kind of discussion against the backdrop of strict rules, not because we resist them, but just simply because the underlying technology is evolving so, so quickly. Uh, you need to have flexibility in implementation. That, of course, uh, there's, there's risk in that. I understand that well. We, we, Google, how are we ever going to get to a standard if we have to agree everything? Um, if we have to agree everything through a, a process. Again, procedural fixes, I think, can address some of those issues. But as I say, the underlying decisions that one has to take are just so complex and evolving that it becomes very difficult to do that in a static way. The kinds of things that we are considering when we look at new interoperability rules, data portability rules are what data? It's an initial question, which data? Which data do we need to disclose? What does it mean for data to be competitively significant? Where would those databases sit? What does it mean for databases to be separated? Is this operational separations? So are we talking about structural separation? So there are some really difficult, solvable, but difficult questions that require fora where Google participates, the agency participates in my submission, and the industry participates. Where you need clear rules, clear underlying criteria, you can't let these things be endless processes, but I think that um, there are opportunities there through uh, consensus building and discussion to come to better, more future-proof solutions. I'm gonna stop there because I think I'm almost at time and there's a terrible fight outside my door, um, but I haven't taken any questions. Right, um, well, uh, we've got the speakers like to chip in before we go to questions. Yeah, I wouldn't mind uh, taking a moment, Peter. I think that's really interesting, Oliver, because um, a little bit what I'm hearing is that principles or past decisions give you some clarity on how you can do almost a self-assessment of what is and isn't allowed when you're thinking about um, vertical launches of products. I think that's really interesting because in my mind, that is the essence of principle-based approach. It gives you a framework to think about whether something is allowed or not um, that you can step through uh, before you engage in the behavior. Um, and, and hence why we call it ex ante, I suppose. Um, I also think you, you raise an interesting point around um, the kind of conversations that uh, you have with your engineers and potentially later down with the regulators about the decisions that you make um, and really welcome kind of that approach of thinking through uh, what the evidence is that you might be able to collect towards what you're doing and um, hopefully in a way to, to have a conversation, a constructive conversation with regulators that, that helps you make the case on whether that behavior was or, or hopefully wasn't um, harmful. Um, what may, maybe I'm interesting to hear a little bit more about Oliver is, is how you see potentially that interaction between rebuttable presumptions and, and particularly um, the, the kind of issue that you've just mentioned on the differentiated approach. Do you think that could be sort of a halfway house? I think that, I think it's, I think it is, uh, I think it is, it is difficult to, I, I put it this way. I, I don't think if our standard for a rebuttable presumption is that we have a, a solid body of evidence that a particular the, the differentiated treatment is typically bad, right? I don't think that that I haven't I don't think that exists in search self preferencing to be very clear. Um, so I think that the the mere fact that a uh, I look, as I hear myself saying this, I think we, we shouldn't get too hung up on the, the nature of the legal test. The reality is today, whether we call it a rebuttable presumption or a presumption or just an area of scrutiny, what happens when uh, a, a company who has been subject to a decision like the shopping decision launches a search vertical is that one gets questions and there are things that one needs to be able to justify. And to some extent, in the reality of the back and forth, you're already kind of rebutting a presumption of sorts, right? You're very big. This is, looks like something that's happened here. So I think the, the flavor of the, the presumption um, probably matters rather 
right? I think, and, and that's a function of how people are going to be prepared to engage with you. Your rebuttable presumption, Tanya, could be to call me up and say, listen, I've noticed that there's a, a new vertical search unit at the top of the search results. We know that those things typically attract a lot of attention. I'm expecting complaints. Can we have a discussion? Another version of a rebuttable presumption is to say, oh, look, I've seen the launch of a, a vertical search unit at the top of the search results, and I'm going to be issuing a fine in the next three months. So I think there are different, different implications for these things. I think the reality is the practical reality of the back and forth of these conversations, particularly with the legal precedent that sits behind some of these decisions, is that they are treated as having a certain characteristic and that's going to, to uh, bring questions to bear. The real force of a rebuttable presumption, of course, is when you find yourself on appeal uh, and then you're able to try and make the, the legal argument that various people haven't discharged their burden. So I think there is a question there perhaps as to your rights of defence and if you find yourself in that world, then the question would be, how fair was it for this to have been treated as typically bad based on what we know about the nature of vertical search? And then final, final, final comment, sorry. It did take us 10 years to get to the shopping decision. Now, some of that was, as I say, procedures that we could have made faster, but it was also because there was a lot of work that needed to be done to get to a decision. Now, if that's the nature of the harm, I would just query the confidence one would have in, 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 in presuming that that kind of conduct is on its face bad. I think um, just one aside from the distant past, um, uh, Oliver, this sense, you know, you said, what data? And this reminds me, of course, when, when uh, BT was privatized and Mercury was set up, BT literally said, what telephone exchanges? Um, and it wouldn't tell anyone where they were, uh, citing national security. And Mercury had to employ a man, they were mainly men, on moped uh, to who'd drive around and spot the buildings that looked distinctively like telecoms exchanges so that they could go and interconnect with them. And I think one of the big challenges for um, the huge global companies like Google is going to be the degree of transparency that will be required with, with the biggest regulators around the world so that they can see inside um, your business and that will be uncomfortable uh, and difficult but it is at the end it will be best for everybody and it says has some analogy I think in the degree to which some financial markets uh, and traders are kind of uh, are now regulated where you know at least I only vaguely understand this I might get it wrong where where you know that literally every word is recorded um, uh, so that it can be analyzed by in-house compliance so that's going to be really difficult um, but it will be um, uh, a route to an answer and there's this odd thing in the sector and I've, I have some knowledge because I've, I've defined technical standards elsewhere at data standards I know what a hideous job that is to get everyone to agree to bloody data standard so we'll never do that again um, but we see in lots of other hazardous industries and forgive me for using that phrase extensive use of standardization of processes and products around ISO type approaches which are also pretty grim um, but they're done for a reason so that we can all understand what is safe. So there is a sort of a modern, is there a, a technology-based uh, analogy to that about openness, transparency, process standards, and so on? But it, as you know, it's going to be an abrupt shift for some of your colleagues. Yeah, I, I think that's, uh, I think it could be more of a painful work. Um, I think that there are four in place. There, there's a, a data transfer port uh, portability um, forum, for example, which is designed to, uh, design standards for user support data between uh, various tech um, products. I think that, you know, and, and this will sound clear, but it's not meant to, I'm not, not big, apologies, but I think there is a distinction between, um, you know, what data, we want more of your data, what data have you got? We want more of your data because this is the data people need. And I think that, you know, that's the kind of, it brings us full circle in a sense, because I think if the nature of the conversation is one where an agency comes with a, a reasoned request, we have identified this difficult barrier to entry that people are trying to overcome in a market that we care about and everyone seems to care about. Can we talk about APIs that plug into these types of data sets? Um, that I think can be a very fruitful, focused, um, and productive conversation for, for everyone involved. You know, to be very frank with you, it takes the sting out of what is a sort of a big issue with no real solution as of yet. You say, oh, this is the area where we need to focus. And I think that would be a, a great relief to a lot of my colleagues. But, uh, but, but some of the approaches can from time to time feel like, well, what, what have you got? What's, in, what, 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 you know, what's there? And, I, and I, a final thought, I do appreciate this is difficult because if the incentive is to create access to data 
in ways that bring new products to market that we can't yet imagine. It's very difficult to say to a company like Google, well, it's this type of data. Um, so that, that analysis, uh, it needs to be done. It's a, it's a challenging task, but I think, I think you're right. I think it comes to transparency and engagement, but hopefully with some direction as to areas that seem to be potentially uh, important to people. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I, yeah, I was just going to make a couple of points. Um, what well, one slightly mischievously, uh, but if, if Oliver uh, wants to stare into a vision of his potential future, um, I can send you a copy of the commitments that we gave to Ofcom separating out open reach. Um, and I suspect that is not the version of the future that you wish to inhabit, but uh, it, 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 it's the, 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 there's some salutary stuff in there uh, on exactly these kinds of points. But the point the point that you made in your talk Oliver that I think really resonated with me was the point you were making about um, liability kicking in on day one and it being very difficult if you know you're in that world where you have liability from day one to actually then have that really open constructive co-creative conversation about what the regime needs to look like and what the right principles are and what the right data is to be supplying to, to, to audit against those principles. Um, that, that really does resonate and I think it's a challenge for regulators to be honest uh, to try and create the safe space because I can completely understand why the regulator wants the ability to enforce I completely understand that you you want the big stick ultimately um, but it is a challenge to create that safe space when the company knows that you can be having a conversation over here that feels very open and constructive but whatever you're saying in that conversation may ultimately be the subject of enforcement action the the addendum to that is even if the regulator can create that safe space and can, can give you confidence that, that that's okay, um, you know, you've still got a, a, an issue with potential you know, claims in the civil court. Um, and and that, is, that always does sit there. I mean, I, I have this experience you know, where, where I sit, you know, that, that, that context is not lost on you when you're having these conversations. And it's just something that always you know, sort of sits in the back of your mind. And you know, it's just an addendum to your point, really. We have a, an anonymous question from earlier, um, which was about um, consumer behavior, actually, in this context. So if, if the um, competition neutrality or fairness of um, an engineered digital journey is to be as, uh, assessed on the basis of outcomes, do, is, it, is it a problem that uh, consumers may be very inattentive uh, or behave in some unpredictable ways. Uh, another way of thinking about it, it uh, is, is the notion of misbuying as important as the notion of mis-selling? Sorry, I, I, I missed your foot. Is the notion of mis... Misbuying as important as the notion of mis-selling? It's my story. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry. I, I, I just think that's the um, It's uh, the, I mean, I think this brings us back to somewhat to the, the topic that I didn't really touch on very much, which is fairness by design and the building of choice architecture by large technology companies uh, and how, you know, you, one can use the design of the user interface to, um, you know, uh, intentionally or negligently affect people's decisions. I understand that well, we've touched a little bit on the uh, loyalty penalties, which takes us into a similar kind of behavioral world. Uh, I, I think I would, um, I'm going to fall back to uh, the fact that these things are reducible to data and, and the kinds of metrics that companies hold on to, right? I think that these decisions, if, if, if one's concern is that uh, the, the consumer journey either through inattention or through uh, um, malevolent design by the technology company is not coming to the right outcome, then what you, what one can look at UX studies. There are A-B tests, there are a variety, there's a panel and panels of, of tests that, that are deployed within companies to give you a better sense of how users are affected by, for example, um, the color of the text, the positioning of the option. We're familiar with various of these, uh, these types of um, uh, engagements on, in our own online lives. So I think you can reduce a lot of this to, uh, uh, to data and metrics and transparency provides a good way of understanding whether there is something nefarious um, happening or not. Uh, one final thought on this, you know, it, 
it does strike me whenever I hear the, the, the narrative around the, the misdirected consumer journey, the fact that, that you don't really know what's happening to you or online. There is within that idea, the notion that consumers would behave very differently if only they knew how they were being manipulated. I think we have to be comfortable with a world where choice architecture is designed in a, in, potentially in a fair way, in, in a way that consumers can understand. There are lots of uh, consents, GDPR consents, that we would love to be redesigned in a more consistent and intuitive way. I feel that certainly. But that the outcomes may not vary much, that people may continue to behave in the way that they always have done. So I think <clears throat> as, as someone who works for a search engine, when I think about providing more choice to consumers across search products, I do that mindful of the fact that Google may continue to be best in class and people need to be comfortable that providing a better choice doesn't necessarily mean that consumers will change their choices. Right. Well, I think we've come to the end of the session as well, which means that uh, the, the, the closing out really um, is to ask each of the speakers, perhaps in the order in which they originally spoke, to just say in one minute or so what message they would like the audience to take away. So that would be William first. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, colleagues, uh, for a fascinating discussion. Um, the, uh, I think the, we, we haven't necessarily arrived at an answer for where on the spectrum one should be between a principles-based approach and a rules-based approach. But I think uh, we have at least managed to open up some of the reasons why those approach, different approaches are preferable in different circumstances, that people have not been calling strongly for everything to be rules-based. And, um, and Oliver might want to close his ears at this point. When I speak to American people in technology companies, um, they're obsessed with everything being rules-based and uh, hammered through the courts and uh, so that everything is reduced to simple rules. And similarly, I remember years ago going to uh, talk with um, uh, Brussels officials when they were just opening up the DSA agenda and explaining this concept of a duty of care and there was much horror that this didn't fit very well into a Napoleonic um, administrative law approach and uh, you could see them going pale but nonetheless they have come out at the end of it with something that uh, requires due diligence and risk assessment in, 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 the, in the DSA. Um, so there's lots of interest but we just keep coming back and I'm delighted everybody keeps coming back from different perspectives on what is the outcome for the person, the citizen, and, and don't look at them just as a consumer unit, um, but as what is the outcome for them. And then from those tiny building blocks, we can build a, overall a better and fairer outcome from everybody through modern effective regulation that requires an open dialogue between the regulator and the regulatee, um, not a uh, gamekeeper poacher with a shotgun um, relationship. Catherine, it's your turn. Uh, yeah, I think that segues quite neatly into, into what I would take away from this as well. Um, it, it, it's always good, isn't it, when you, when you reach the conclusion that more research is needed. Um, and I think we're, we're, we're sort of in that space. Um, but I think what I, what I would say is to go back to, to, to what I was saying a little bit earlier on about it being quite clear, as, as Will was just saying, that you know, principles-based type approaches, whether they are at the extreme end of that spectrum or a little bit closer to the rule setting uh, end of the spectrum as Tanya was setting out, um, they do require a change in mindset. They require a change in the, the thought process and the behavior of the different actors in, in, in the system. And I suppose the, the thing I was pondering through a lot of the, the discussion was the value perhaps, you know, when regulators do embark on a more sort of principles-based process of, perhaps the creation of some sort of a, of a maturity model for the different actors uh, who are participating in, 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 the, in that, that change process, because it, it, it is a change process, uh, and maybe doing some baselining uh, at the start and, and monitoring the progress, because actually this is an evolutionary process. This is a learning process. Uh, and as, as people go through this, uh, the principles themselves will evolve, what we think they mean will evolve, the behaviour in the sector between regulator, regulated companies and civil society will evolve. Um, and I think it's important to capture the learning um, and, and for the regulator and indeed everybody else to take ownership uh, of the need to learn and improve and refine uh, and, and, and move through this uh, as a process. So I suppose that's uh, a slightly sort of meta level comment for me to finish on, but I think it's quite important. Tanya. 
Yeah, just to build on that, I think from my perspective, the, the, the key point is that we question ourselves. We question ourselves what the harm is that we're trying to resolve and whether the behavior that leads to that harm um, is very complex specific or not. And where it is not, then a rule can be very powerful and we shouldn't shy away from it. Where it is, then we should be open to a principle-based approach because really it will help us make better decisions. Um, and uh, I suppose the second point I think I would try and land is that it's not an either or. Um, these two tools can be used together in a very powerful way. And there's sort of lots of coping mechanisms like guidelines or block exemptions or rebuttable presumptions that can help us deal with a lot of the shortcomings of those approaches that, um, that often get thrown at them. Um, the last word to Oliver. Thank you. Um, I have I've, so many great ideas of, of, uh, that I'll take away from this session. It's been very interesting to me. I, I guess two things to strike, strike me. First, um, I don't think you have to worry about needing to choose. The title of our session sort of rules or principles that you have to choose where you stand on a particular issue. I don't think that's, that's the, the case. We've talked very much about spectrums, but I think even within the same issue, it's quite fine to identify a harm and to, you, an evidence harm, as I've said previously, an evidence harm that is the, the catalyst for a conversation between industry and, and agency. Um, and, and over time that may evolve into a set of principles that you want to test over time and iterate on and determine whether they have been effective for the outcome, but they may well evolve into rules in ways that you weren't able to anticipate. There may be subsets of rules that will be a, a better way of addressing components of the principle that we were trying to achieve. So I think not being, uh, 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 sort of being open-minded to those kinds of evolutions is probably an important thing. And a core cool component of that from my perspective as I think about how uh, I talk to the company about these kinds of processes is to um, move away from a, a mode of thinking about regulation as something that needs to be associated with words like cost and pain and avoidance to a world where, as was touched on quite eloquently by someone else earlier in the session, to a world where you see um, regulatory engagement as an opportunity to compete more vigorously because you understand the rules better than anyone else does and to be more creative, to, to move away from the strictures that someone like me can impose on your team meetings, your product launch decisions, to a world where you're operating in a safe set of principles, which allows you to be more creative and focus on innovation. Those are the opportunities I see, and, and, and this session makes me feel more optimistic, so thank you. Well, that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, it uh, just remains for me now to thank the speakers for taking time out of their busy lives to say so many interesting things, and to wish everybody a pleasant evening. That's the end of the event. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.